is the math outreach. Okay, of my, the math outreach coordinator. Uh, as part of that, uh, and he has done wonderful work. He probably might be the most proud of the fact that two of his undergraduate students have entries in the online encyclopedia of integer sequences, uh, which uh, is a wonderful result for any mathematician, let alone two undergraduate students. So um, you have heard speaking uh, the computer voice saying that this is being recorded. So you will um, be able to see uh, videos talk after it'll be posted on the MSA website. But now I'm going to turn it over to uh, Dr. Bagdazar and he will um, tell us about being on the edge in an augmented world. So thank you, Ovidia. Thank you very much, uh, Cory, for the very generous uh, introduction. I'm uh, really honored to be invited uh, as a keynote speaker at uh, the OCMA uh, fourth, 40th uh, conference. I really wished I could uh, join you in person, but uh, COVID uh, put everyone, uh, each of us on the edge. <laughs> And uh, it, uh, we were all forced to live in, a, in an augmented world. So there we are now. <clears throat> I'm now sharing my uh, PDF. I'll make it uh, as a presentation. I might change this uh, a few times in the, during the presentation. <clears throat> so uh, my um, presentation is entitled On the Edge of Mathematics from the Classroom to Applications and Infinity, because uh, my core activity is uh, that of a teacher. Uh, I am very keen to promote my students, to give them an edge uh, so that they are competitive on the, in the job market. And uh, I think as teachers, I, I, as a teacher, I feel that uh, the students are my true business card. And if uh, my students are doing well and achieve their full potential, then this means that this is an indicator that uh, I've been doing a good job in my playing a part in their success. Uh, I've uh, added here two logos, so the University of Derby where I work uh, and also the, university, the World University Rankings because uh, the University of Derby was uh, like 15 years ago, it was not in the top 100 universities in the UK. And uh, through the work uh, of uh, other people like me who have international activity, who support their students well, we were able to go through the rankings and uh, we were now uh, like three, four years ago, we joined the top thousand universities in the world uh, without having very uh, a significant research footprint. Now we worked on that, and this year for the first time we were in the six in the next band, so 600 to 800 universities, with pockets of excellence where we are think uh, we are I think uh, even better. And the outline of my talk is as follows: uh, first, mathematics. Uh, we are at the mathematics conference. Uh, we discuss about mathematics, but uh, I think each of us has its own uh, definition, its own understanding of what mathematics really is. I want to discuss a little bit about the edge because Cory uh, had uh, a very interesting uh, invitation uh, in January, 2020. Uh, he invited me to, to present about mathematics on the edge. So that was the topic I had in mind. I thought about it and then actually it's very interesting to see what, uh, what uh, the edge is and what mathematicians tend to do with the various notions which seem obvious and then they complicate them <laughs> to such an extent that even professionals uh, cannot uh, understand what is going on. And then uh, to give some examples of mathematics on the edge. Mathematics on the edge of in science. <clears throat> Here I wanted to give you um, an idea of how mathematics supports sciences and some key ideas from mathematics, which are essential in many fields. Then mathematics in society, mathematics as a skill, and also the reason why mathematics is not the most loved uh, sub subject. Then mathematics in the classroom, how can we support? I think each of us is trying to support students to do their best, but uh, I uh, thought that I could share some of the things I've been doing with my students. Also uh, how mathematics keep keeps every, everyone on the edge. So students, teachers, you have the very keen students who are on the edge of their seat. Then you have the students who are on the edge of, this, of uh, despair, uh, who really don't want to be in the classroom, 
but they have to take the class. And also you have uh, teachers being on the edge of patience and of their uh, psychological resources. And also uh, how mathematics keeps everyone on the edge in the education sector because of its importance for employability. Institutions have to support their students to do well in mathematics eventually. Uh, this pushes technology companies as well to provide new resources, new approaches, uh, especially during the pandemic. You'll see uh, some slides later. And also working together, all these actors can improve and develop new practices. And also uh, how I think mathematics can support employers and uh, various industries. And uh, finally, I have a, sh a short quiz for you. I did not get the chance to set it up in Polev, but you can, uh, uh, take, uh, you can give the answers on paper and then uh, we can discuss. So that is the plan. Indeed, uh, I'm an associate professor in mathematics. Uh, I, uh, I was exposed to applied mathematics, which I did not really like, uh, and pure mathematics, which I love much more. Uh, I like counting very much, and uh, today I, I gave a lecture at a few years, actually a few few uh, hours uh, back, and I gave uh, the students uh, an example, the following joke about uh, uh, about uh, relationship relations. I was teaching relations and functions, and I gave them that uh, the joke that uh, the relationship between pure and applied mathematicians is based on trust and understanding. Pure mathematicians don't trust applied mathematicians and applied mathematicians don't understand pure mathematicians. So uh, yes, I, I was able to combine somehow the, the two worlds of a pure and applied. And I was exposed to uh, big data analytics. So this is a direct application of mathematics, then Erasmus Turing. So this is the replacement scheme for Erasmus. Uh, I'm doing research in a number of uh, I'm doing research in a number of uh, fields. And basically, if I have with whom, uh, I try to do my best to contribute and engage and support and find a way to, to develop new results. I published two key uh, textbooks uh, for the students. Uh, first was for computational mathematics students. You'll see something about them in a moment. And then also, this is a textbook uh, where I included results obtained over 10 years of research. Uh, in collaboration with uh, Dorina Andrika from Cluj-Napoca. So this is a book which has both the uh, key results regarding recurrent sequences, applications, and also problems. And I also wanted uh, to uh, uh, show another work I've been doing. So this will appear again in the presentation. And this is related to the application of mathematics to the investigation of criminal networks. So I'll present uh, some details about this work in a moment. Now, at the time when the, the pandemic hit, I was uh, in the process of uh, quite a few visits. Uh, in 2019, I visited Czech Republic, I visited Turkey, I visited Italy, I visited uh, Ireland, all this for conferences or for uh, uh, research, uh, for uh, uh, exchange visits. Then in December, I visited uh, China, December 2019. I did not bring COVID myself. Uh, then in January, I visited uh, India for, uh, for a conference. And then I had big plans to visit Canada in May 2020. Uh, however, uh, instead of being at the edge of the world, I was uh, on the edge of my bed in uh, May 2020. Uh, and finally, I'm very glad that the conference is finally happening. I'm very happy to be you know, with uh, all of you in this augmented uh, setting. And I hope that eventually we will be able to meet uh, also face to face, because I think uh, there is much more exchange of um, uh, non-verbal uh, non information uh, face to face. <laughs> few words about the University of Derby because I think this is this is important to provide the ethos where I developed as a lecturer. We are the birthplace of the Industrial Revolution. We have very good industrial connections in the regions with Rolls-Royce, Toyota, JCB, Bombardier. So this is Canadian. Uh, and uh, this is where Lara Croft was developed by student, 
by graduates from the University of Derby. They set up the company which produced Lara Croft. This is our main building. The university's motto is inspire, innovate and impact. We were in the top 30 in the Guardian League tables in 2019. We are renowned for teaching excellence. We have invested as much as we could in providing top uh, quality resources to our students. So like uh, new sports facilities, uh, new STEM uh, building and so on. Uh, what makes us special is that we are student centered. We work with the students in partnership. You'll see some examples in a moment. Uh, we also are encouraged to use our research into teaching uh, and uh, we engage actively with employers because in the UK, the payment for university year is about 9,000 pounds, which is quite expensive for many. And uh, this means that we have to do our best to provide value for money so that students actually have a good uh, reason to come. And uh, yeah, this is a photo uh, which shows my uh, focus on international links. And uh, um, I think this combines with the problem solving skills and uh, a vision uh, to develop, to work in collaboration. Uh, I, I include this, uh, this photo because uh, this is the first time I've met uh, Professor Raza Ramachandran from India. Uh, at uh, the International Congress of Mathematicians in 2014. Uh, this event attracted 5,500 mathematicians from around the world. I was a fresh, young lecturer. I was accepted to present a paper there. And so was my collaborator now. We've met in front of uh, Korean uh, costumes uh, testing. We took a photo together. We liked each other. And then two years after he invited me as a keynote presenter at, his, at the conference he was organizing. And then we started to keep in touch. We published more, now more than eight, eight nine papers. Uh, one of his students who was a master student at that time, I wrote a recommendation for him now to apply for Max Planck Institute uh, for a role there as a researcher. So I think uh, you'll see in the following slides that uh, I think what makes us special in uh, the education sector is that uh, we try to help uh, students to keep their minds open. And I think uh, the true sign of education is that we keep our minds open as well. So who knew uh, seven years ago that uh, just a meeting and uh, shaking hands at a conference uh, could lead to so many developments. So we published lots of papers. I went to India three times invited. So this means, uh, this is, uh, what this says about me is that uh, if I see an interesting opportunity, I give it my best shot, and then I see what, what, hap what comes out of that. Now a bit of background of uh, what uh, motivated me to engage with lots of uh, collaborations and lots of partners. This was uh, coming from my, uh, from my classroom. Uh, my first task, uh, my first classroom assi class assignment was uh, a lecture with 150, 180 students. These were computing students having their, own, their only mathematics module, which uh, they, they hated before. They didn't uh, want to be in the room at uh, the start. I had many anxious students. National Student Survey, this is like the holy grail for, especially for smaller universities focused on teaching because everyone aims to have like feedback, stu feedback, feedback satisfa st sat student satisfaction with uh, overall satisfaction. Everyone wants to have it 90%. And across computer science modules, this was often like 40, 50%. And this was a math module that they didn't want to do. And uh, yes, I had to uh, develop, I had to rewrite basically the course from scratch. I had to redesign the assessment so that it's all computer-based, it's uh, inclusive, it has multiple attempts. It's assessment. It design is designed uh, around assessment for learning. So I had to develop like 800 questions to have comprehensive testing for the. But then I also tried to infuse the students. Uh, I provided the best materials I could with textbook, with recordings, math jokes. Uh, they had to be there, and uh, then. I started to get, it, my initial feedback was uh, Ovidio moves like a potato and uh, speaks like a potato. Uh, also, my accent was not uh, very British. Uh, and, uh, but in the end, I had the feedback from the students that um, as a result of our feedback, Ovidio became a much better lecturer. 
So I took their feedback up front, I responded and I adapted to improve their experience. And then I started to collect this kind of feedback. So I really like how we were able to retake the online tests as this became the perfect revision tool. It facilitated my learning and comprehension of all the material presented. And then I have like very frank uh, feedback. So this is, uh, this is how the feedback is presented in our class. We have like lots of long questionnaires. The students have to respond. And this was like student satisfaction, overall satisfaction with my course. This was 97%. And the students were saying, I have always sucked at maths. Even in school, I barely scrapped a C. Strangely, I'm enjoying computational mathematics to the point I enjoy doing some in the spare time. And then I use this kind of feedback to motivate future cohorts. And now let's see, we've, we discussed already about what is, what is mathematics, but now let's see what uh, the experts, what various experts say. Roger Bacon was saying that mathematics is the key and the door to the sciences. Galileo Galilei was saying that the universe is written in the language of mathematics, but also mathematics has its own difficulties and it often frustrates those who try to use it or to understand it or to develop it. So Einstein was saying, do not worry about your problems with mathematics. I assure you that mine are far greater. I'm also very honest with the students. I tell them that I have lots of problems I cannot solve. So if they feel that at some point uh, they don't, they have lots of things they don't understand, I tell them that I'm in the same boat all the time because I also have lots of problems I don't understand. And when, when I finally manage to make some progress with one problem I'm working on, then that becomes a new paper. Also, I think people, most, uh, most people are biased against mathematics, even so Martin Luther, the famous uh, actor of the reformation, uh, he was saying that medicine makes people ill, mathematics makes them sad, and theology makes them sinful. So not a very positive view on, uh, on mathematics. And uh, it's, so this is mathematics and education. Now, my two favorite quotes on education are that education is not the feeling of a pale, but the lighting of, the, of a fire. And uh, this is maybe my favorite quote on education. So education's purpose is to replace an empty mind with an open one. So this means that I try to help my students to open their minds, uh, to see uh, what, uh, what opportunities uh, are ahead of them, and then tr try to support them to really take the opportunities. And to, uh, I try to help them to take the opportunities and also to build the skills required to, to make the most of these opportunities. Uh, I assume that uh, most of you are, uh, have been exposed to a fair dose of uh, mathematics. Uh, I, I'm not sure if you expect how mathematics, uh, how big uh, mathematics is. Uh, so if you want to see how, how big is mathematics, you can check MSc, Mathematics Subject Classification of 2020. I checked a few moments ago and it has 151 pages where they just list, list on one row, they just list the name of a mathematical subject. So there are more than 6,000 mathematics subjects. So you have like, if you think like it's uh, students expect, yeah, I'm very good uh, with mathematics. I know, I know I'm doing, uh, I'm fine with the uh, quadratics. I know algebra, I know, I know geometry. I'm fine, I know everything. But actually mathematics is much bigger than that. And I think maybe I, a professional mathematician might be exposed during the career to maybe 10 uh, subjects out of 5,000. So. Actually, mathematics is very big. So this means that there is also great potential to, to be able to collaborate, to, to, to contribute and to develop new results. And uh, Corey has already mentioned the online encyclopedia of integer sequences. Indeed, I have two students who produced their own sequences. I also added more than 100 uh, to the encyclopedia myself. And uh, this encyclopedia has more than 350,000 sequences indexed. And uh, what's interesting about the sequences is that if you click on a sequence number, it gives you uh, the numerical sequence, but also lots of interesting connections to other sequences. And this, is, this became a great resource for research. So if you work on a normally enumeration problem or partitions problem, or if you count anything, then you are very likely to transform, you can uh, normally transform that problem into a numerical sequence. And uh, then you can 
uh, you can um, ch check, you can search for the terms of the sequence in the encyclopedia. And if the sequence does not exist, then you can add it yourself. If the sequence already exists, then you will definitely find other connections to many other interesting sequences. So this means that you can expand the scope of your research and, and identify interesting connections to other unexpected uh, areas in mathematics. And normally, so when I was doing research related to polygonal polynomials or partitions, we had a paper published this year in the Ramanujan Journal of Mathematics. And this was about how can, in how many ways can you split uh, a set of uh, numbers into k subsets in such that each subset has the same sum. So that was an interesting sequence. And then we were able to build the theory and also link that thing to elliptic curves, which, is, which, which are used in cryptography. So uh, this encyclopedia helped. Now, I told you that I'm using mass jokes with the students. I give you one which is uh, with, uh, with um, Halloween, so you can tell it in class. So why do mathematicians often confuse Christmas and Halloween? Because Oct 31st is DEC 25, 25th, right? So 31 in base 8 is 25 in base 10. Uh, also, I versus pi. Pi says to I, come on, get real. And I responds to pi, oh, be rational. And then golden rule of teaching mathematics, you must tell the truth, nothing but the truth, but not the whole truth. I think this is particularly useful uh, when uh, mathematicians teach because we tend to give like every detail, but not maybe not all of that is necessary. And uh, I found this interesting joke about uh, mathematicians versus computer scientists. There is an extension to software engineers as well, but I didn't want to put that into writing. Uh, and this is inspired by the quote of uh, Isaac Newton who was saying that if I was able to see that far, it's because I stood on the shoulders of giants. And for this reason, we say that mathematicians stand on each other's shoulders, computer scientists stand on each other's toes, and then software engineers dig each other's graves. Yes, I've seen this in uh, working. And also uh, there is uh, wisdom. So I think mathematics can give you an edge in terms of wisdom as well. So Albert Einstein was complaining that since mathematicians have invaded the theory of relativity and they started to use mathematical symbols, I do not understand it myself anymore. Erdős was saying that all mathematicians never die, they just lose some of their functions. And uh, this is uh, an interesting uh, introduction to recurrences. Grigore Moisil, he was a very famous Romanian mathematician and acknowledged by ACM as father of computer science as well for, uh, for uh, his contributions. He was saying that every man has right to a glass of wine, but when you drink a glass of wine, you become another man. So the corollary is that every man has right to infinitely many glasses of wine. And uh, I like this quote very much by John von Neumann, another father of computer science, another cont great contributor. He was saying that if people do not believe that mathematics is simple, it is because they do not realize how complicated life is. And the different times during the lectures, normally halfway through, I try to give them a joke, so which is related to what they learn in class. And I think this, we got some responses, they, the students relax a little bit and then they are ready to move on. And now because uh, the initial topic was the edge in mathematics, just a, a quick Google, I check, what is the edge? What is, do we have any definition? of the edge. And uh, yes, you have lots of definitions. That's the problem. So for a polygon, an edge is a line segment on the boundary joining one vertex to another. I think everyone knows. And now, but for polyhedron, an edge is a line segment where two faces meet. Now, what is the definition of a face? And then with like with two clicks, you can get into, into a polyhedra, in n dimensions, <laughs> and you see how mathematicians can make every simple idea complicated. Also, edge uh, is uh, the Edinburgh Geometry Seminar. So this is their abbreviation. And also I thought, how can you link uh, edges? So to polygons and what is the circle? And you can view actually, if you inscribe uh, a regular polygon inside the circle, and then if you make, uh, if you let the, um, if you let uh, the number of uh, edges go to infinity, 
then actually the edge, uh, the limit of, um, of a poly regular polygon is a circle, right? So in the, if, in the limit of infinitely many edges, the polygon becomes a circle. And also, um, I found another very interesting approach, and I had this in mind when uh, when I was thinking of uh, of uh, the edge of the topic. So the edge is also something dangerous because you don't want to fall over the edge. If you think of the edge of a cliff, and we also have the cutting edge that you'd like to give uh, students in order to be competitive. And uh, now, in terms of uh, importance of mathematics to other disciplines, I thought of uh, mathematics like basic mathematics with profound impact in computing, especially in number theory, which is the branch of mathematics studying integers. Uh, in the, sim the simplest um, equation involving uh, integers is uh, represented by Pythagoras theorem, where you have uh, the length of the hypotenuse square is the sum of uh, the, the adjacent sides, the, of the squares of the adjacent sides. And uh, we were able to solve this uh, equation since antiquity. It has a simple uh, formula, it has a simple uh, um, solution, five, three, four. However, we can easily show that there are infinitely many solutions. Uh, some of the, them were were uh, written in cuneiform writing on Plimpton's uh, tablet. Uh, but uh, then, and uh, also in, in uh, ancient Greece, we, we were able, so ancient Greeks were able to find all the solutions to this quadratic equation in integers. So this is called Diophantine equation if it has uh, integer solutions. And uh, the problem was what if instead of using squares, you are, you are trying to use cubes, cubic powers or fourth powers and so on. And uh, this was a problem stated by Fermat in 1637. So find the triples ABC such that you have A power N equals B power N plus C e power N for N greater or equal than three. And he said that I found the solution, but I wrote it, uh, I could not uh, write it all on the, this uh, side of a newspaper. And then mathematicians tried to solve the problem for many, many years. And only after 358 years, they were able to finally close the problem. And, uh, but in this process, lots of new mathematics was developed. And uh, this made Donald Knuth, another parent of uh, computer science, he was saying that virtually every theorem in elementary number theory arises in a natural motivated way in connection with the problem of making computers do high speed numerical calculations. So you, you can have simply simple properties, simple theorems, but this can have profound impact in, uh, in practical applications in computing. And uh, yes, here I wanted to discuss more about infinity, about the different types of infinity. Uh, I'm sure you are familiar with uh, so if you take the natural numbers and if you take out the, if the odd numbers, then these two infinite sets have exactly the same number of elements. And this is the, sh the smallest infinite set, which is Aleph zero. However, real numbers are a totally different type of infinity. And uh, this shows that uh, mathematicians were able to tame infinity. Uh, however, I wanted to give you an example of um, other types of the mathematics on the edge where I contributed as well. So this is mathematics and the cutting gauge of data science. And um, in, a, in a number of papers uh, published in collaboration with uh, my uh, PhD student, Lucia Cavallaro, she submitted her PhD thesis uh, last month. Uh, we looked at network science strategies to investigate real criminal networks uh, focused on two Sicilian ma to, to, uh, to two families in the Sicilian mafia, and uh, yeah, so you can you can I, I will share the presentation after the talk, or you can simply Google plus one Sicilian mafia criminal networks, and then you can get. Uh, we have another paper published uh, this August as well. And uh, what what was our approach? Uh, we looked at juridical acts from a, a big European uh, criminal investigation on mafia families. Uh, 
we were able to, to, to build the networks of two types. Then we applied some notions related to social network analysis. Actually, this is like basic network theory. We looked at some algorithms and we were able to build models for the, for, for this, uh, for the structure of these mafia families. Then we were able to play with the models and we were able to, to simulate the behavior of these networks. We were able to build algorithms for maximizing the impact of, um, of uh, police uh, actions. So if you want to destructure a, a network, what is the best way to do it? And uh, this was, this was the, the, the basic approach. So we have uh, the nodes in this network are the different uh, suspects. Then you have edges uh, in, this, in, this, in the first network, you have an edge every time a phone call is made between two people. The, the higher the number of calls, the, uh, the thicker the edge gets, and also the larger the, the, larger the, the node uh, becomes. And in this way, so this was a first network obtained from eavesdropping. And then there was another network based on meetings between the members. And uh, extracting this information from, uh, the, from the juridical acts, we were able to, to build a model of the network. And then we were, play, we, we were able to play with various algorithms. And we looked at uh, what was the shortest path, what was the largest con co connected component. Uh, if you have money, for example, so police resources or uh, investigators resources are limited. If you only have uh, resources to interview or to arrest 10 members of these families, what, those, what uh, should those members be? And so on, and then we were able to apply algorithms to disrupt the the, um, the activity. And um, then we had the significant interest from newspapers, uh, scientific newspapers. Uh, we appeared in the Daily Mail as well. Uh, interest from the national television in Italy, especially. Uh, also, uh, we were invited to give interviews and to, to have our photos in the in the newspaper in Miss Sicily. And also, I thought maybe we could give the address as well. And also, we had uh, we had interest from the special operations unit in uh, in our region, because these are uh, these are approaches which can give investigators an edge over the over over the criminals. Now, mathematics on the edge in terms of uh, students and the uh, teachers. So I mentioned that in the classroom, mathematics keeps everyone on the edge. So keen students on the edge of their seats. So these are the very enthusiastic uh, students who just absorb what is taught. Then anxious students on the edge of despair. I have uh, students who still don't, cannot find their materials after four weeks of explaining every week. And also teachers, I think it pushes, uh, push, pushes uh, the patience of teachers to the limit of, uh, to the edge. Uh, to address these uh, issues, uh, we developed many projects involving students. Uh, we've employed uh, students to support students, so student mentors supporting uh, students in uh, junior years. Uh, in order to build the skills of students, we went in, in, to support uh, local schools. I designed, uh, in collaboration with the students, all these um, Derby marketing uh, Derby branded uh, materials. So the t-shirts and so on. And we, here we supported a school activity with 400 students from across the region. I normally try to tweet everything we do so that, uh, yes, we are, what we do is visible and inspires others as well. And we try to create research opportunities for students. So Corey mentioned that uh, two of my students published their um, sequences but actually students do much more than that. So I have uh, students who published papers, like serious papers with me, um, and they are involved now. They do, we have students going to do PhD. We have students doing research projects. We have students winning research bursaries as well. And uh, we try to create a community 
of mathematicians where non-mathematicians are welcome to join. We also have a significant investment in the university, which recognized the, uh, the importance of mathematics support across the institution. And uh, this involves, again, lots of students. And uh, I want to share with you, I hope uh, the sound works. So this is, this is a, a video produced by Natalie. Natalie is a very special student. So she is a mature student. We have many mature students at the University of Derby. But Natalie is also a senior fellow at the University of Cambridge. And uh, she's, uh, she owns a company in real estate. But she we turned around the Mathematics Society. And she inspired us with Twitter. With, uh, we have now a YouTube channel. We have blog for students. And this is a video we produced recently um, for, uh, for the Math Society. And I would just like to have a confirmation from Corey to see if you can hear the sound. So I'll check. Uh, no, actually nothing is coming through. It, so is the, is the sound coming through? No. Uh, no, it might be in a separate, a different window. Uh, yes, 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 yes. Uh, I will, I will, uh, um, I will now share my screen. And I'll make, um, I'll make, uh, I'll, I'll put the video in the screen in that screen. So uh, hopefully that works. So I think you can see the video. You can see the window for the video. But now let's see if you can hear the sound. Uh, no, nothing. No, we, we're not seeing a video. Uh, yes, now I'm sharing the... Now oh, there we go. The, yes, and can you hear the sound? Uh, no sound. Okay, then I, I think I just need to put the. Um, ah, share sound. I think I, I, now the sound should work. Yep. Okay, it, it's only one minute, but I really, really enjoyed it. It's quite dramatic as well. And this is our promotion for the Maths Hub. Yes, and uh, so this is our uh, promotional uh, video for the Maths Hub. I also wanted to show you this is, so these were all activities uh, which involved uh, our students, presentations of uh, who we are. Uh, these were activities uh, as part of the enhancement week that you'll, uh, you'll see in a moment uh, again. Uh, yes, and I think these are, these are things that uh, I'm very proud of. And uh, these are things I would not be able to do myself. And uh, I think this is, this is great about um, having a community of students uh, developing all these activities. Now, uh, with uh, this COVID pandemic, uh, we, all, we all had to develop uh, new edges to our practice. I had to develop uh, new types of interactive lectures, Blackboard Collaborate polls to make the sessions interactive. And I was very proud uh, that in some of the sessions I had 100% engagement. So we had to find ways to make all these sessions work. And I think uh, this helped us all to develop, uh, I think much better materials than before. Uh, yes, you can also be uh, on the edge through your students. Uh, in a class, I had a student who posted a link and I didn't know what that link was. And then this was, um, his um, evaluation, his article about my practice. And it was really, really interesting. And uh, there was a, a lot of praise for the resources available. 
but it was uh, again very interesting uh, to hear from the students it was live as well during the session in order to give students an edge and uh, make them competitive we also have uh, many courses focused around developing skills so we have the maths group project in which students in second year work in teams they work on real problems from industry they work with toyota bombardier bosch rolls royce and they develop communication skills, presentation skills, problem solving, and data analysis. Uh, I also want to show you uh, the evolution of a student. So this is a photo I took with a student when I visited the student during the industrial placement between second and third years. The student was assistant to the operations manager of a huge warehouse, which was as big as seven football pitches. And have, they, having, they were having about 1,000 workers every day going between shelves and so on. And I asked them, what is the algorithm? Normally a, a picker was going to a printer, pressing a button, getting a list of items to collect from the shelves and then to, to take them to the dispatch area. But no one knew if there was an algorithm producing that, what was the base for that? Uh, was there any routing algorithm to, to take you? What was the shortest path for those things? And then uh, Luke worked on uh, some, problems related to this for his dissertation. And then I checked his uh, LinkedIn profile. So after finishing his degree in mathematics in 2018, he went as a transport operations administrator. And then he is now since November 2019, he's transport team leader for DHL. So now if uh, we have this crisis with, uh, with the logistics in the UK, we know whom to blame. <clears throat> we know we have a good contact at uh, DHL. Uh, we also promote and uh, try to get uh, more success stories. Uh, we have uh, we had three students joining entering the, the IBM Watson Analytics Global Competition in 2018. They are the only UK team in the top 10 in the world. They came ninth, and uh, after they all did the industrial placement. And uh, this year, I I connected again with uh, with Claire. Uh, and uh, she came back to give a presentation uh, as part of the enhancement week. And after leaving the University of Derby, uh, she went back to IBM. And then she's now a lead technical business analyst working on problems with HMRC and so on. And she has now a great career. And it all started with a maths degree, maths with education. We also have research bursaries for undergrad students. And these were two of my students, Manzal and Chadni. And this was their visit to Romania to the best uh, road in the world. This is what Top Gear mentioned. And we tried to create such opportunities. So the students were supported by Erasmus bursary, by research bursary. They worked on a real problem in a ceramics factory, which produces the ceramics for IKEA. And through research connections, they were able to work in the factory, to do simulations. And now they both do PhD in, in mathematics at, at Loughborough University, one of the top universities in the UK. And now uh, I mentioned that uh, actually um, mathematics uh, keeps everyone on the edge, including te technology collaborators, technology companies. And uh, now, looking back at, the, at uh, my presentation at, at what at I wanted to present, I, I've actually realized that my top three technology partners are all from Canada. And I started the, the, the work with, uh, with uh, companies uh, with MapleSoft. I knew about Maple since I was a student. Then when I was a TA at Nottingham, we were using uh, Maple, Maple for uh, symbolic calculations. And then in 2017, I had a research visitor from Romania who came also to give a short course with Erasmus. And this uh, visitor presented some really advanced mathematics, uh, global optimization, very complicated algebra. He's uh, like genius level. He's uh, helping Maple to improve their algorithms and he's finding bugs in the existing algorithms. And uh, he gave this presentation showcasing the power of Maple. And then I got in touch with the Maple, uh, with Maple UK, uh, and we started. Uh, we were given some licenses, and we started the collaboration. Uh, this year, we also worked with Maple uh, to deploy, uh, to uh, to develop 
a presentation focused on data science for, for the students in my, in my data science program. Uh, however, then with uh, Stasi uh, in the UK, uh, we started to use Mobius as well. And uh, again, I'm one person, I cannot do everything. And I think also companies uh, can do lots of things uh, we, in collaboration with universities. I believe that there is uh, room for every innovative uh, company. So our second partner was Digital Ed. Now this is the new branding for Mobius. And uh, we had, we had, uh, collab we had uh, colleagues in engineering who took up uh, Mobius as, the as their tool for assessment. And for a course with 140 students, they turned around the module, uh, pass rates went from 40% to 70% in one year. And it, it, passed, it, it improved from there as well. And we now have access to li licenses, to bundles uh, with ready-made materials. I also participated in a webinar uh, in September, 2020 uh, on the topic, can STEM be taught online? My observation was that now we have no option actually, COVID uh, made us all go online. So uh, we had to do it. Yeah, actually, Ovidio, I'm sorry to interrupt, but is it possible that we could go back to a full sharing screen uh, so people can see uh, what's uh, going on? Uh, so I was not sharing. Uh... It was windowed, so it's showing up kind of small. And you were full screen before. Uh, okay. Um... Is that- There the... we go. Okay, okay. got you. Thank you. Great, thank you. Yes, and uh, um, I think there was a providential moment uh, as well in, uh, in March, 2018, when I was invited by Stasi Ravel to support uh, the stand of uh, Möbius at the conference at uh, the British Congress of Mathematical Education. And there I've met uh, one of uh, the people who changed my life, I can say, uh, in the person of uh, Graham Orput, uh, who really fascinated me uh, through his uh, approach and uh, through his uh, personality and vision, because um, uh, we bumped into each other and he said, hi, my name is Graham and my dream is a world where everyone enjoys maths. I said, really, that's my dream as well. So let's see how can we, let's see how can we collaborate? I think it was very good chemistry. And also uh, what was very special about Graham and what is very special about Graham was that uh, he was not just, he was not a company providing a product, but uh, he, he said, I have uh, the, the technology, so the software uh, technology, and I have, the, I have the industrial hat, but also have the academic hat. So he was also an expert in education. And I think these things made us work very closely together. And this was uh, the first visit of, uh, of Graham and Anand to the University of Derby. And uh, yeah, this led to a great uh, collaboration. At that time, I knew that e-assessment was the way to go. And I, I had tried various things. I tried Blackboard assessments. This was my, my, my first attempt to, to help my class. But then in conversations with Graham, I came across a much bigger, bigger problem. Uh, I was worried initially about the very low number of students in the UK taking A-levels. The percentage is dreadful. It's about 15%, 15%, 20% maximum every year, which is very low in Romania, where I'm from, the percentage is 90%. The percentage in, um, in um, Japan, so East Asia, Eastern Europe, it's 100%, nearly 100% of students taking maths beyond the age of 16. And in the UK, this number was low, but then in discussions with Graham, when I organized the first uh, workshop at Derby, he mentioned actually that's not the biggest problem, the number of students taking A-levels. The problem is that there is nothing provided for the others. And indeed, looking at data, we found that numeracy skills training is a, is a very big society problem. And the government statistics from this year show that 17 million adults in the UK, which is about half of the working age population, have numeracy levels expected of primary school children. In, the, the economic impact is 20 billion pounds a year. And the gap between literacy and numeracy is increasing. And there is clear evidence that uh, this leads to better numeracy leads to better uh, salaries uh, and uh, 
also there is a society problem in the UK because people proudly claim that I, I'm very bad with maths. And then everyone, instead of saying, you know, this is really a shame, no one says that I'm, I cannot read. But people make a good team saying that, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm very poor with maths. And I think we should challenge that. And we should also try to provide uh, support. And uh, the steps uh, in the work with uh, Graham, Anand, and Vreta were we signed a partnership, uh, we set up pilot projects. I found in this kind of uh, resource that they were providing with Elevate My Maths, this was the kind of tool I needed in my class as self study resource to provide to the students so that I don't have to teach Pythagoras five times. So that was my like the, 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 the basic level reason. But then uh, we developed lots of other things. And I th this is the idea I'm trying to emphasize here is that uh, I think lots of things can be achieved and uh, uh, mathematical education can be transformed if academia works in partnership with, with the industry. Uh, it's not. Uh, I, meant, I made it clear with all our partners that we are not. Uh, we are not um, just uh, beneficiaries of existing resources, but we would like to work in partnership to develop the resources our students actually need. And uh, then what I found, what I found with uh, Breta, if I if we wanted to develop something, then we were able to develop uh, that. And I think we went. Uh, we we got very far. So we, we first, in the first year, we deployed an existing uh, resource. I called, we called it Advanced Numeracy Skills uh, course. Uh, this was deployed to about 300 students, mostly in engineering and technology, in Derby and also in Greece. Uh, feedback was very good, especially from students who are out of education for many years. So we had a student who was uh, outside education for 25 years. And then the student really went through the structure of the resources, you first have diagnostic assessment, then you have upgrading modules. So these are remedy videos, and then you have summative assessment. And then the students could go over and over again through the remedy videos. And in this way, they were able to address their gaps because what I found in my class and also other colleagues found in engineering, you have many students who can understand the concepts. They have a good uh, feel for how the various uh, engineering principles or computing principles work, but sometimes they struggle with um, uh, fractions, they struggle with some of the basic maths. So their gaps may not be even from secondary school, but they might struggle with some very basic stuff from primary school. And here I would like to commend uh, the work of uh, people in Canada with Seneca College uh, who were able to excavate, to dig for this, for the root of, uh, of the problem. So you can have like the most advanced techniques to teach uh, an advanced concept, but the problem is that if your student still struggles with, uh, with fractions, then uh, the impact is limited because the students will get frustrated whenever they understand everything, but they don't get the final result correctly. And then we were able to develop 12 new courses, uh, dashboards presenting uh, the, the resources in the way we wanted, modular uh, structure of courses. So with, with uh, the, the bigger course uh, broken down in multiple topics, each of the topics having diagnostic, remedy, summative assessment. Based on this dashboard, I was I'm able to give uh, student feedback in 10 seconds. So I can look at the number of students doing the first remedy. And this is 174. So this is the largest number in this dashboard. So this is the number, the total number of students engaging. Then I look at the fourth summative. So these are the students who completed all the previous three summatives. So this tells me how many students engaged to a significant degree. And then if I look at the, the proficiency assessment, the number of students with 80% or more also get a digital badge. So we deployed digital badges. Then we were able to look at the impact these resources had on the class. And I was really, really astonished. Um, we lo I looked at data. So these are, um, we can look at, uh, I think this is the most uh, significant data. So EMM impact, this is the first pass rate. So the number, of, the percentage of students scoring above 40%. So these are the students who pass the module in the first seat. And then the number of good, the percentage of good grades. 
So these are, this is the percentage of students scoring 60% or above. So these are, these are some metrics which are important for the university. And in the three years before I de deployed numeracy training uh, courses, the, the, the average pass rate was, let's say, 85%. So I knew it was good. I was looking after the students. I was providing them with lots of support. The number of good grades was about 58, 59, 60%. Then after the first deployment, this was through a website. It was not really ideal. It was just a, it was just an off-the-shelf course, and still pass rates. The first time pass rate improved to 89% overall. The good grades stayed at 58%. But then I also checked who were actually the students who completed the CMM course, and for those students, the pass rate was 93%, and the good grades 64%. However, over the last two years. Despite COVID, so despite many, many universities went down in terms of the rankings with NSS because of student satisfaction. But what happened in my course during COVID times, pass rates overall for classes of 108 students and uh, 180 and 159 students, pass rate overall stayed at 89%. But this percentage also includes lots of students who actually gave up and vanished. When I looked at the student and still overall good grades went to 73% and 70%. However, for, for the students who actually engaged properly with the courses, now with, I deployed two custom-made uh, courses, D1 and D2, from Darby 1, Darby 2. The pass rate for the students who passed the, the numeracy training course was 98% and 96% in two consecutive years. Then, uh, the, the good grades were 87% and 83%. So now I can show everyone in my university and elsewhere that if you help students feel their numeracy, uh, build num numeracy skills, then this gives them an edge in terms of passing the, mod the, the course. And in my course where they have two numeracy training courses, I can say that in the, you know, in the COVID language that we often use. So uh, if you improve your numeracy, you can develop immunity against course failure. So that was my statement about uh, this impact. Now, in order to give the students an edge in terms of employability, uh, we have also developed numeracy training course, uh, uh, badges. So once the students complete fully a uh, numeracy training course, they get a digital badge as well. You can click here to see. I, I also completed these courses myself. So I, I shared them, I shared the badges on social media. And we have a pretty good usage. And now this, these courses are deployed throughout the university. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, how can mathematics give you an edge in terms of employability? I only realized this when I became a lecturer. I was preparing for the interview uh, 10 years ago, almost, uh, for the interview to become a lecturer at Derby. And I came across a very interesting book which was best answer, great answers to tough interview questions. And I thought, I'll, I'll read this book and, I, and then I'll be able to answer any questions they might uh, ask me. Uh, uh, that was not the case. However, in the preface, I found that one of the most useful things I have came across in my life, uh, which was the author was mentioning that every employer is looking for the same skill. And then I thought, how could this be? Uh, you can apply to become a manager or to become a cleaner or to become a, a teaching assistant or to become a vice chancellor. So how is every employer looking for the same skill? And the author was saying yes. And this skill is problem solving. And then I had the Neureka moment. Uh, I thought, actually, wait a minute. Uh, I'm a mathematician and I'm doing problem solving for a living. I've, I've been doing problem solving for 20, 25 years. So I should be in pole position. Uh, for any type of job, if I have the, the, the other skills as well, right? So if I have some competence in something, I'm a good problem solver. And then I try to instill this into my students as well. And these are the key steps in problem solving. These were articulated more than 60 years ago by Poya. The first step is understand the problem. Second step, make a plan. Third step, carry out the plan. Fourth step, look back on your work. How could it be better? And uh, I think one of the big reasons for the problems we are facing uh, these days is that uh, 
many, most people, including politicians, they start solving the problem, they start with the solutions before they understand what the problem is. So I think mathematicians can help a lot. And uh, also uh, through mathematics, we can help students to build their employability skills. Uh, also inspired by these words by Bill Gates. He was saying that no more than ever, an education that emphasizes general problem skills will be very important. And uh, I just wanted to highlight a question given at a job interview on uh, Wall Street and the annual salary for, an ent for uh, a programmer was $270,000. And uh, the applicant was given, there is a spider on the floor and uh, they gave the coordinates. There is also a fly on the ceiling and uh, the coordinates were given. And the question was, calculate the shortest distance the spider can take to reach the fly, right? So uh, I, I, I was not able to deploy the, to deploy the quiz uh, in Polev. I think uh, we are a bit over time as well, but I wanted to show you three questions that I normally use in uh, in um, in uh, presentations uh, to to students in open days in applicant days because I think this uh, helps students see problems from a different perspective. I think this is where mathematics is also very important. So mathematics uh, develops your thinking, also. Uh, asking you to see the question from a different perspective. So what is the shortest path for the end from A to B? So you can take this, uh, these questions at home, but this problem is very similar to the one used in the interview because you, what you have to do is to just unfold the cube. So you have a cube. If you unfold this cube, then you can, uh, you, the, que the solution becomes very simple because the shortest path, if you unfold the cube this way, then the shortest path between A and B is just the straight line. In the second question, you have to find the, the number of the parking space under the car. And uh, here again, this, this uh, question invites you to, to change your perspective. So it may seem puzzling, uh, many students struggle with it, but if you change your perspective, so in this case, if you rotate your head with 180 degrees, it's not easy if you are not an owl, but if you, if you are standing and if you read the question, twisting your head with 180 degrees, like uh, nearly, nearly headless uh, Nick, in Harry Potter, then uh, you can see actually, if you look at the question upside down, this was 86, 87, 88, 89, 90, 91. So very often in mathematics, if you change your, the perspective, the solution becomes uh, evident. And finally, the question, the last question I prepared uh, for today as a demonstration is count the squares in the following diagram. So these are examples of questions we are using in, uh, in, uh, in quizzes with, uh, with the students and also in school presentations, in school visits. And uh, if you have to count the squares in this diagram, this is an example of a problem. So can, some of the squares are easy to see. So like the very small squares, one by one. You also have a big square here, which is three by three. But here the secret is to break down the big problem into smaller problems you can solve at a time. So this is another very important uh, problem solving principle. So you make a strategy. Yes, it's like, I want to count the squares. Now, how do I count the squares? I just need to identify the different sizes of the squares. So I have squares one by one, how many? One, two, three, four, five. Then I have squares which are two by two, how many? I have one, two, three, then, um, uh, four, five, and then I have a square which is three by three. So if I break down the problem, the big problem into smaller problems, then I can solve the problem. And uh, in my presentation, I tried to, to make a case that mathematics gives everyone an edge and uh, mathematics even gives you the, the definition. I wanted to show you something related to fractals as well. <clears throat> maybe, maybe I have, uh, 
maybe I have time to just show you very quickly. Uh, so I wanted to show this as well with dimension. Normally dimensions, we know that a point has dimension zero, uh, a line has dimension one, uh, a surface has dimension two, then uh, a cube has dimension three and so on. And these are used uh, for, for example, for vectors. Uh, very often we hear in physics, uh, there is a model for the universe which uses 17 uh, dimensions or 18 dimensions. How many dimensions can you have in mathematics? It's easy to see that in mathematics you can have, if you represent a an object in 3D by a triplet of coordinates, then you can have as many coordinates as you like. So we can easily represent objects in n dimensions. We also have uh, examples, the continuous functions from zero one to real numbers. We can easily show that this is an infinitely dimensional uh, space. But now we have other types of uh, objects which mathematicians uh, have created and then they had to explain. And when, when they tried to explain, they created new mathematics that uh, is not very easy to understand all the time. And uh, for example, the fractals are objects which are obtained by infinite iterations. An example, a simple example is the Sierpinski triangle in which you start with a, with a triangle, then you take the midpoints. So that's the zero iteration. That's the original object. In the first iteration, you take the midpoints of the, the original triangle and you extract the core. In the second iteration, you, you already start from three field triangles and you extract the core of each. And then you keep doing this for every existing triangle and each exist, each existing tri so in, in each uh, iteration, the triangles you are working with are similar, are actually equal to each other. And now the question is, uh, what on earth do you get? What's, what's with this object? Uh, and if you take the, if you, if you start working with the perimeter, with the, the areas of these triangles, what you find if you denote by A0 the original area and P0 the, the original perimeter, it's very easy to see that uh, A1, so the first area, the area of the first object is three quarters of the original area. And because you are applying the same type of transformation, every time you iterate, the area is multiplied, the area at the step n is three quarters of the area at step a n minus one. But this means that the area is three uh, at the step n is three quarters power n times the original area, which means that in, in as n goes to infinity, the area of this object is zero. So the fractal is what you get in the end. Then in terms of perimeter, the perimeter is multiplied by three quarters with each iteration. So you get an object. So through a simple mathematical operation, you get an object which has zero area and infinite perimeter. So what, on, what is the dimension of this object? And uh, yes, the dimension is somewhere. It is not one because it has infinite perimeter. It's not uh, two because it has zero area. So it's somewhere between one and two. But in order to give a number, you have to develop a theory. And uh, if you look deeper into this, the Hausdorff dimension of this object is 1.585. So this is log three over log two. So I think mathematicians can, uh, mathematics gives you the language in which to, to explore lots of interesting things. And also it gives you an edge uh, in terms of employability. And uh, yes, I'm a big advocate of working in partnership between uh, students, between academia, and between industry. And uh, I think this is uh, the end of my talk. Thank you very much uh, for uh, having me. Thank you for your patience. I'm happy to take any questions. Oh, right. Thank you very much, Ovidio. Um, as with any keynote speaker, you have a, a wide range of topics, and I'm sure there's going to be a wide range uh, of questions before and after. I do have some in the queue already. Um, and so the first one um, is, uh, so what do you do for students who do not engage at all? So this would happen around your slides uh, with showing your mastery product there. Uh, we know that if we have engaging students, we have a good result, but what happens with the non-engaging students? 
I think this is uh, so. Thank you for uh, the question. It's a very good question. Especially, especially, uh, this is not uh, this is not an easy thing uh, to to sort out. Uh, we cannot punish the students, uh, especially with COVID. Uh, we could not even see the students if they were deciding to join the class and uh, not uh, participate. Uh, there was not much you could do about it. The way I try to engage the students, I remember once I was in a, I was in a class with about 120 students and I was telling them, look, please engage. It's, you know, to your benefit. Uh, there is evidence showing that uh, students who engage do well, pass, no problem. And then I realized that I had 120 students who were doing well mm -hmm. on the course. And I said, sorry, guys, it's not about you <laughs> because you are those in the class. I actually am trying to reach those who are not in the class. So, um, and for those, uh, what I'm trying to do is at least to provide the resources for them. I send announcements uh, which are uh, sent not only, of course, not only to the students in class, but also to every mm -hmm. student mm -hmm. in the, the enrolled. Mm -hmm. um, yes, so, yes. but it's, it's not an easy one. Because if the students now, especially with COVID, I had students whom I've never seen. Uh, if we, we were teaching remotely and I had um, a nice encounter with a student, uh, I was coming to the university one evening and someone says, hello, I'm Daniel. I said, good to meet you. <laughs> and uh, he said, I'm your, I'm your student. I was your student this year, nice course. I passed, I'm very happy. I said, I, I've never seen you. <laughs> it was all online, but I think it's a, not an easy one. <clears throat> all right, thank you. Um, and so uh, we have a, uh, another question um, and it says, does numeracy for you mean be able to do basic operations with numbers or is there something more? Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, numeracy is uh, more than, uh, it's much more than uh, doing basic uh, number operations. Actually, what, uh, what uh, we've done in terms of uh, numeracy support, we took all the lessons uh, developed for uh, Canadian colleges that were available to me. And uh, this included uh, works we work with, uh, of course, with fractions, percentages, but there was also some financial mathematics. Uh, again, not very advanced. So it's not like, it's not the, the content which, which requires a lot of technical content. But here, the context is very important. So it's like dosage calculations for nurses. So these were very important uh, concepts, not very advanced mathematics, but everything to do with percentages, everything to do with uh, ratios, fractions, but also some basic elements of uh, statistics as well. Uh, then uh, um, composite uh, interest. So all these things uh, to me come under uh, numeracy. All right, thank you. Um, and this is more uh, for more recent uh, items. Um, did you notice a change in students from being tested in person versus being tested online when you were looking at your pass rate, your good rate, uh, your good grade rates? So uh, I looked at the. So I expect that uh, there might be some uh, risk uh, for collusion. However, in the way that the tests are designed, uh, students don't have much time to, to complete the test. And uh, what uh, my assessment strategy for computational mathematics is 50% of, uh, of the assessment is uh, takeaway uh, tests, uh, which are automatically generated. So every time a student takes a test, a different test comes in front of them. I don't uh, randomize the, the order of the questions because I want the students to be able to revise. So if they, uh, they get question seven consistently wrong, I want them to be able to identify very quickly which lesson is that from, and then go back and uh, revise. And then 50% is, uh, is, uh, the, um, is a lab assessment. And I have not noticed uh, very much difference in terms of the home assessment. Because this, uh, in, in terms of the, so 50% was uh, a lab test. And now during COVID, we had, uh, we could not uh, run lab tests, uh, but the assessment is two hours. 
long 30 questions so the students uh, don't have very much time to um, to look around even if they use uh, internet or so if, if they know if they don't know what they are doing they are not uh, they are not going to pass for this okay. yes yes so in 2000 so i i see okay yes Okay, great. Uh, and so I think yeah, you did see the, the question pop up there and when you're comparing it to the in-person, right? Yes. Okay, great. Um, okay, I am, uh, I don't see uh, any more questions, um, but I'll give people one minute. Well, I just wanted to point out that one of your collaborators, uh, Graham Orpwood, uh, does have uh, somewhat of a reputation on the Ontario College System because he's instrumental in doing something called the College Student Achievement Project, which was how we highlighted the discrepancy, shall we say, between uh, student preparation in the elementary schools, high schools, and as they come into Ontario. So uh, we were uh, very pleased uh, that Graham was able to do that work for our system. Uh, and so it's uh, it's very nice that uh, he became to be a, a collaborator um, of yours as well. Um, so I think we are good for questions. So um, I would like to thank on behalf of the OCME executive here at Fern, the OCME executive uh, uh, out and about, and also the OCM members. I want to thank Avidio uh, for taking some time. Um, I can still see he's in his office and uh, I hope everyone uh, can uh, appreciate the fact that this is after tea time. Uh, so this is well after hours, you should be in your pajamas by now. Um, uh, so we thank you very much uh, for being the first uh, of hopefully many international Ontario um, Association Mathematics, uh, uh, Ontario College Mathematics Association uh, keynote speakers. Uh, so thank you very much. Um, and uh, thank you everyone. Uh, we still have one more session uh, today at three o'clock and then that will conclude uh, our first day of our 40-ish annual conference. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yes, and I really hope that we can meet in person at some uh, at some point. Oh yes, once I, once we have in person uh, events back again, I uh, will uh, definitely look forward to meeting you uh, and meeting with all the same uh, people. Thank you very much. Okay, everyone's going out. Okay, everyone's going out uh, of video, but I just wanted to show you the people on C uh, OC Mayor are here. So I'm going to turn my camera around and you can see this is our war room going on right now. Hello. So we have Maria and we have Derek. Um, and Derek's up in Thunder, Thunder Bay. So I think the equivalent, it would be like Edinburgh from Southampton or something like that. So ah. he's he's quite a ways away from, from the rest of us. Uh, mm -hmm. So yeah, also, uh, Ontario is a big place. Uh, so yes, and, I think uh, in, in Canada, everything is quite uh, is quite big. <laughs> great, great, very good. Um, so um, thank you for staying up so late and working so late um, for us. Um, we will have this uh, posted um, uh, online on the OCMA website, and so you'll be able to, to, to link to that. Uh, and uh, thank you for your talk. I'm sure yes. everyone quite appreciated. I think we all, we were all riveted right through. We had lots of uh, strong participation right away through. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks. Bye-bye. See you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you.